you've seen it before. And uh, today, the question is, if evolution is true, then? So that's the reason I put this one back up here, is that uh, the secular view, of course, with evolution is that uh, the sun will eventually burn out, it will get dim, and all life forms in our system will cease. And that's the future. And regardless of whether it's uh, a few thousand years or a few million years from now, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, this is the end as predicted by evolution. And they cannot deny this because in this so-called Big Bang, and when the sun was formed, the sun was formed, uh, according to their theory, just by so many helium atoms. And uh, we have this uh, thermonuclear-like furnace and it's burning the fuel up and it's just like you putting coal or wood on a fire. You only have a certain amount of fuel and you're going to burn it up and when you burn it up there will be no heat come from it, it will go cold. And that's exactly what will happen with our system uh, if it were to last long enough. Now, here's what's amazing. If you have an end point, in other words, if there's an end point even predicted by the evolutionist or anyone else, no matter who they are, Anything to have an end point must have a beginning point. It cannot have eternally existed in the past. Because if it's uh, consuming and burning up the, uh, the, so you might say the fuel, then it has to have a starting time. In other words, you have a fire in your fireplace. You have to start the fire. And you have a certain amount of logs on it. And when they burn up, the fire goes out. And that's where our sun is. Our sun had a definite beginning time and it's going to have a very specific ending time. And even the evolutionists, all scientists, will agree in accordance with the second law of thermodynamics that the sun will dim and burn out and all life forms will cease. And so that's the inevitable end by the secular view. Now, Christian view gives a little more uh, information. In 2 Peter 3.10 and 13, we have that the day of the Lord will come and the heavens will pass away and there'll be a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. And that's a very good description of uh, when atoms start falling apart. You know, we talked about how that we've experimented around with atoms and we've knocked the little particles out of atoms and start a chain reaction in accordance with the amount of mass we start with and you have a certain thermonuclear weapon or an atomic bomb a certain size according with the critical mass that you have to begin with. And so if you, if everything, the whole creation becomes a critical mass and all atoms fall apart, that's exactly what would happen. The heavens, the whole creation would pass away instantly and it would do it with a great, tremendous noise. You know, when you set off a nuclear bomb, you have a great noise and you have a tremendous amount of heat and you melt everything where the fireball is. And of course, it's limited by its critical mass of the weapon. But here we have the entire universe as we know it will go into this critical stage and uh, start falling apart and everything will melt and uh, will just vanish. And it says the earth is included in this. And then, of course, we look forward to a new heaven and earth. And you say, well, where in the world... Well, the people be, since people are eternal, whether believers or unbelievers, they're eternal. There's no such thing as an unbeliever that will cease to exist. Uh, if you believe that way, then you believe some of the theology of the Jehovah Witnesses on annihilationism. I'm not sure what the Mormons do with non-Mormons. I know what they do with Mormons. They make them into gods, and they get their own heaven and earth, you know. And so you see the great distortions that you have in theology with some of these uh, world religions. Well, that's the, that's the future, the secular and the Christian. Now, just like Ray was giving something from the Reuters news agency, this one was Friday in the paper. Every week, I mean, I don't save them all. But uh, I thought this one was interesting. Remember back when we studied uh, evolution and we showed where we had no nothing and nothing went to something and that something was just all rock and mold and mass and primordial oceans or whatever. And then all of a sudden from nowhere became the first sail, the first living sail. And then that first living sail had to make a lot of little living sails somewhere. And uh, these, were, uh, these were the first one-sailed living organisms like bacteria 
And then the next stage was they become fungi. And, you know, they become proteus, the one-cell living organisms with a cell membrane. And then you've got fungi, where, which were halfway between becoming plants and animals, and plants and animals came off of fungi. So you had the, the monera, which are the one cell without a nuclear membrane. Then you get the proteus one cell with a nuclear membrane. And then you get into the fungi, which not sure if it's plant or animal, and it turns out, according to this article especially, it probably was the originator of plants and animals. And that's uh, even what Ray was referring to when he said that out of this helium cloud eventually came everything, plants and animals. In one sentence that he read you, you went from helium to the complex system we have today in one sentence without any explanation. You said, well, in an article we just make a summary statement. Well, that's the problem with evolution. They're always making summary statements. And uh, these summary statements are based on uh, theories like uniformitarianism, which they deny they believe in, but they do. In fact, it's right in this article right here. I can show it to you. They don't, they don't say uniformitarianism, but they, they use it. Well, this is plant life may have appeared twice as early as thought. In other words, it's much older. See, they need... See, since they found out the universe is this 12 to 15 billion years out there with Hubble telescope, they're having a little problem fitting in a three and a half to five billion creation, not a creation, but an evolution, into this, uh, this uh, three and a half to five billion. So now they have to fit it into this 12 to 15 billion. So now they have to make everything older. Everything keeps getting older and farther away and more unobservable and all that. The first fungi may have appeared on land a billion years ago nearly twice as early as previous believed. I'm going to skip some of the sentences in this article. If plants indeed colonize the land that early, now did you notice that? We went from fungi to plants. If plants indeed colonize the land that early, they have, may have had a major effect on climate and the development of other life. In other words, these fungi came into existence twice as far back, and if that's the case, they probably had uh, they had uh, arrived to, you know, give der a derivation to plants, and if that's true, then, oh my, it's much farther back than we thought, then let's see what's going to happen. It says, uh, university research team developed these new estimates. Now, they developed these new estimates. You notice they did not do any experimentation. They developed them. And why did they develop them? Because they need now to fit the information into 12 to 15 billion years. Whereas before, they only needed to fit the information in three and a half to five billion years. Now they have to fit it in 12 to 15 billion. You ever notice how they like to just deal and say in three and a half to five billion, they spell out the word billion, and, and they, they deal with just 12 to 15 billion, and they spell out the word billion? Sometimes sit down and see what the difference is between three billion and 12 billion. I think you'll find there's a tremendous amount of difference 12 billion is four times as long as 3 billion. And we're talking in billions now. And uh, pretty big sums right there. Said, uh, how could the presence of these land plants have affected land and climate? The team's findings are published in today's issue of the Journal of Science. You notice this? In other words, this is uh, published in the Journal of Science. And so this is a prestigious uh, uh, scientific uh, journal, everybody will read it and they will ooh and ah about it, about this great new finding, and this finding came just because it was worked out by a team. Now what is this team trying to do when they're trying to work this information out? They already have a preconceived theory, right? Evolution? They're going to make all this fit their theory. That's what they're doing. When they say they work it out, they work it out to fit their theory. Their conclusion is already drawn. They would not dream in any way of taking any of this information and letting it influence them not to believe in evolution. In other words, they're only going to look at the information in a way that it must conclusively support and prove evolution. By studying the rate of mutations, now this is what they're doing. Notice this now. They're studying the rate of mutations today. By studying the rate of mutations in a number of plant and fungi genes, they were able to calculate back in time, you notice that? And estimate the point when the species separated 
and primitive algae emerged from the water and colonized the then barren land. Do you see what they just did? They looked at mutations in current day genes and then they assume that that rate has always happened in the past, right? Because that's the only way that you... Now listen to it again. By studying the rate of mutations in a number of plant and fungi genes, they were able to calculate back in time. In other words, by using the rate today, assuming the rate has always been the same in the past, that's uniformitarianism, then we say, okay, if that's the case with all these different mutations. Now the other uh, guesswork here is, how many t mutations did it take to get from there to here? And so you estimate that, say how many mutations, and then you just back calculate and say, oh, this happened 100 million years ago, a billion years ago. And what, what amazes me is, they did this same thing when they had three and a half to five billion years. But then all of a sudden they got 12 to 15, they throw everything else out. And they recalculate. But they recalculate to make it fit the theory. Because just listen to it. And uh, it said uh, they were able to back calculate this and said they were a then able to conclude that fungi colonized land 1.3 billion years ago. In other words, it got a new, new figure. The colonization occurred 1.3 billion years ago and plants followed about 700 million years ago. Previous estimates based on fossils indicated plants and fungi appeared on land between 480 million and 460 million years ago. In other words, they were wrong before, right? They said previous estimates were such and such, then they were wrong. If they're correcting their information, then they were wrong. They made a mistake. But you don't see any or hear anything about we were wrong or we made a mistake. It's just that we have now uh, this new information and we're publishing it in this prestigious scientific magazine, see? And that said, the presence of plants taking up carbon dioxide from the early atmosphere. Now look here, we got fungi, and all of a sudden we have plants. And after we have the plants, we have this abundance of carbon dioxide, and so that's what plants feed on. They take carbon dioxide in from the environment, and they make uh, sugars out of that when they combine carbon dioxide and water in the presence of sunlight at a certain wavelength and they make uh, these uh, carbohydrate sugars and they give off oxygen. So now they're trying to explain that they had all this large amount of carbon dioxide in the meantime the fungi had jumped out of the ocean somewhere and become fungi and then the fungi gave rise to plants and all of a sudden the plants found this great abundance of carbon dioxide and really turned on and started really evolving and put out all this oxygen. Let's see what this oxygen did now. Thus adding oxygen to the atmosphere. This would have cooled the climate, had an impact on development of life, including the preparation of animals which need oxygen. Now all of a sudden, you're already up to animals in just a sentence or two with no explanation. The cooling in particular been involved in a series of snowball earths, episodes in which the planet was covered with ice between 750 million and 580 million years ago. How do they know that? How do they know the planet was covered by ice 580 million years ago? I mean, you ever think about that? How do they know? Oh, they know because they're smart, highly educated. They had no observers there. There's no written records. There's not anything. It's an it's, uh, estimate based upon guesswork, based upon a theory that it happened. And then they set about to look for information to prove their theory, and then they say it's absolute. It said, uh, this was followed by the Cambrian explosion of animal life. You see, in the Cambrian layer, which is about a mile deep, you have 17 complex forms of animals in that just suddenly appear in the Cambrian geological layer. And this thing is deep. In some places it's very shallow though. But 17 complex life forms, and this is supposed to be the first emergence of life, and yet it's already 17 different diverse complex forms. Well, where are the ancestors? Well, they say, well, the ancestors are in the pre-Cambrian rock, but they're so deep 
and so much pressure on them, so much heat, it destroyed them. It destroyed them. But yet you have the Cambian, which is the very next layer up, and you have these beautiful fossils in detail, even to some point, with tentacles on their heads. Fossilized. And uh, why didn't the heat and the pressure get those if they got the ones in just the next layer below? Now, we are proposing a biological explanation, not experiments, not experiments. We're proposing a biological explanation for these two seemingly unrelated phenomena, that's plants and animals, which before had geological explanations such as plate tectonics. In the article, we and uh, so this was a telephone interview that the this uh, person, the scientist, had given to some reporter. It was picked up by the Associated Press, and then all the Associated Press papers put it in their newspaper. And it is strictly speculation of a team from a university uh, receiving uh, grant money to do experimentation. And 99% of the experimentation is done in the arena of trying to prove evolution. They are so desperately looking for everything. Well, you know, I showed you my little dinosaur book. Dinosaurs in the Bible, a little pamphlet just talks all about dinosaurs in the Bible. Well, it just so happens we had a couple of grandchildren down to a little tourist place yesterday and went to a reptile place and they had a little book, Let's Explore Dinosaurs. Huh, $1.99. Not very expensive. And uh, in here, there's a teacher that introduces a couple of her students to a, um, a scientist. Let's see how they introduce him here. Good morning, class, said Ms. Lore. Today our visitor is Dr. Scully. He is a paleontologist. He studies dinosaurs, and he is going to help us learn about some of the dinosaurs that lived many, many years ago. Watch this. Close your eyes, boys and girls, while Dr. Scully tells you a little bit about dinosaurs. We're going to use our imagination here. And let me tell, start by telling you what a dinosaur is, the terrible lizard and all that. No, so, so, and so, and so. Because dinosaurs walked the earth more than 65 million years ago when there were no people. But paleontologists, you know, they find these bones and they put them together like puzzle pieces to build the dinosaur skeletons you see in museums. And uh, so as you can see, the rest of the book then just talks about these different kinds of dinosaurs. And the very first thing they set the pace with is we have a, a person who is highly educated. He has a fancy uh, degree in paleontology and he just absolutely has to speak the truth, right? He's so educated and everything. And he's so smart. And he knows, he knows all about dinosaurs. How does he know about dinosaurs? He only knows what he's been told. He doesn't know a single thing about a dinosaur except what he's been told. And what has he been told in his school, his education? Who told him that? Evolutionists. Teaching evolutionary geology and paleontology and anthropology and uh, all of that. And so without any experimentation or anything. And we've already talked about the frauds that's been committed. So well, the, the brontosaurus. No such dinosaur as a brontosaurus. It was the head off of one dinosaur and the body off another found over a mile apart, a year apart, put together to come up with a new species of dinosaur so somebody could become famous and get their name in the books and all that kind of thing. Well, we're not going to readdress all those things. We just want to get ourselves into where we want to go today. And uh, remember, what we're doing is we're still comparing uh, creation evolutionism. And today we're talking about if evolution is true, then what? Then we came from nothing to something. We were in chaos and unorganized. And we're talking about millions and billions of years ago. Suddenly, without an external anything, energy or... Uh, a prime mover or a god or anything, this unliving material, this rock, these basic elements, organized itself. And it organized itself into the non-living. Isn't that amazing? It organized itself into the non-living. 
And then the non-living further organized itself into the living. And we started with a very, very simple one cell without a nuclear membrane and went to one cell with a nuclear membrane, went to multicellular, went to fungi, went to plants, went to animals, and all the way up to the most complex of animals of all man. That's what we're doing over here in the evolutionary line. And it was survival of the fittest, chaos, killing, eating one another, uh, having to fight the, the cave bear and all those things and having to fight the environment and the ice ages and, and erupting volcanoes and primordial oceans and, you know, fighting all this chaos as this thing's getting organized. And uh, competitors, in other words, everything was competing. And, of course, the big competition now is, they say, between man and insects. And the future, of course, is as how we started the death of our star. We have no future. So if evolution is true, then there is no God. There are no miracles. There's no creation. The whole universe self-actuated. And without any kind of direction or guidance, it is headed toward the complex state and this complex state is going to totally cease to exist. No matter who survives, you're amongst the competitors. The whole thing is going to cease at the death of our star. So we've desperately got to have a space program. We've got to develop some kind of spaceships. And we've got to get some of the elitist off of this planet and recolonize them somewhere where that man can continue to go. So that's the big thing behind the space program is we've got to get off of this planet. And uh, we only have uh, a few million years to do it. So we have to get busy. And uh, why the effort to the moon? Go to the moon, step off stage for step off base to step on into the other of the, uh, our, our part of the system. But we're going to have to move outside our system because our sun is going to go out. We need to find a young sun that has just come into existence somewhere. And we've read articles in here where scientists supposedly can see where stars are being made. Remember last week we read an article that says the shadow, they still can see the shadow of one place when all this big bang occurred and uh, when these stars started, uh, you know, all this matter started coalescing into stars and we call our star the sun, of course. Well, the other side over here, we've talked about that, and we'll continue to talk about it. And uh, so what we want to do now, though, is we want to get into today's subject. If evolution is true, then there's no creator God. And so what you immediately have to do is you have to throw out Genesis 1-1 and many, many other verses of the Bible. Because Genesis 1-1, if you'll recall, says in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. We've gone over this verse before. God here is, um, is Elohim, the divine sovereign creator, that facet, that character of God. You know, God's name is Hayah. He said, uh, you know, Hayah, Asher, Hayah, I am that or I am which or that I am. And uh, so it said he told Moses, but... All through the Bible, he's known by other character names. And this is one of them here, Elohim, where it says God in your Bible here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, where it says God. In Hebrew, that's Elohim. And that's like acting out of the um, uh, divine, sovereign, creator aspect. Also like the Trinity. Elohim is a plural word. And uh, in fact, uh, right here, this verse, it's very interesting. It's this uh, God word right here is a plural word, Elohim. And that em on the end makes that a masculine plural. El, just el is a singular word. But Elohim is a plural word. But what's interesting in Hebrew is that this verb right here, created, that's bara. And bara is the third masculine singular form. So we have a plural subject with a singular, third masculine singular subject inside the verb. In other words, in Hebrew, the, the verb has the subject of the verb embedded in it, so therefore you have no doubt as to who in the sentence is the subject of that particular sentence. And so it says here, in the beginning, which was the beginning of the heavens and the earth, God, the divine sovereign creator Elohim, the, the Trinity, He created, 
in, uh, he's singular even though he's uh, a trinity in his creative role here, the uh, trinity was present at the creation, uh, it says he created. That's the word bara, because it would be barat if, if they created, if it was a group of women, and bara if it was uh, bara, if it was uh, a feminine creator, singular, and uh, bara would be uh, feminine, uh, plural, and barim, barim, I believe it is, would be the form of the, um, uh, I'm, I'm a little off there. I'm, I'm using that putting in participial forms, but that doesn't make any difference. Anyway, there's four different forms right here this word could take. There's many, many other forms. A verb can take over a hundred forms in Hebrew. But uh, right here, this one here is a third masculine uh, singular. The cow perfect, third masculine singular. Okay. And it says, what did he create? The heavens and the earth. Now, why didn't he just say the universe? Why did God say the heavens and the earth? Because he brought the earth out special. Now, the evolutionists do not bring the earth out special. So if evolution is true, earth has no special place in the creation. It just so happens to be where we're at. But uh, surely there must be other life forms elsewhere by ratio and proportion, right? Just by guesswork with all these millions and billions of stars. There's got to be other life forms, so what do we need to do? We need to send out radios with signals on them and trying to attract their attention. And we need to send spaceships and we need to send satellites. We need to do all kinds of things, try to get in touch with these others. And uh, because uh, there just must be. And you know what the big deal is over stem shell right now? The people that are supporting stem cell? You've been reading about it in the paper and everything? Do you know the group that's really behind that is a group that believes and this cloning thing, stem cell, stem cell and cloning, the main, mainly the cloning one, they believe all of us are clones of aliens. And they think that we should keep cloning ourselves because we were cloned. And this is a group of scientists now. I'm talking about PhDs. And they really and truly feel we are clones. There's an organization, I've forgotten their name, and... Uh, but you could probably find it if you just go to your computer and start looking up cloning and you'll find somewhere some articles and it'll tell you that these people that's really pushing cloning are uh, basically this religious group and they feel that we are clones of extraterrestrial aliens that visited here. And see that was the basis of Star Wars and Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica on the television programs. That uh, Somebody came by, and the reason the Egyptians had their head dressed the way they did was that was a semblance of a space helmet. See, you've heard those stories. All those lines down in South America with those birds and frogs and things over many miles. And they're saying only somebody from space could have seen well enough to place those things where they were and make those designs. The guy went down there and proved he could make them. No problem, just right on the ground. And uh, so, but you see, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to affect this evolutionary thought process or this extra alien or extraterrestrial thing, you know. And because you're getting in the way of their budget to get money to get out there into space. And you'd be surprised how much money is being spent by our nation in support of evolutionary thought process. The whole space effort. I mean, why aren't we satisfied with our Earth? You know, and we're the green planet. Nowhere else have they ever found anything like us. You know, nowhere else. Beautiful things in heavens, but uh, Scripture also says all these things in heaven were created just for our pleasure to look at. Used to, we could see a lot more in the heavens than we can today. In fact, we have, we have so put out so many lights now, you know, street lights and these mercury vapors and all these lights in shopping centers and all these lights along the freeway and everything. We have actually polluted our atmosphere with light. You never hear about light pollution. You always hear about air pollution as far as chemicals and soil pollution with chemicals and water pollution with chemicals and all that. But you never hear about the pollution of our atmosphere with light. As a result of man polluting the atmosphere with light, we no longer can see the beauty of the heavens. And... Uh, uh, a lot of you all probably somewhere near my age in here, you remember just short 50 years ago, 
how beautiful the uh, the Milky Way was and the stars. You could just like you could reach out and grab a handful of them right out there, just right at the atmosphere, just right at the just like that, you know. Beautiful. And uh, the Milky Way is the arm of the arm of our, one of the arms of our galaxy. And we're looking through that arm, and that's what that Milky Way is. We see the arm of our galaxy. Millions and millions of other suns, stars, just in that one arm that you see. And that's just one arm of our galaxy, one part of it that we're looking through to look out into space. Well, if evolution is true, then there's no creator God, so we have to throw out Genesis 1-1. And all other references in the Bible that God created. You have to throw them out. Because you can't have a Bible that has lies in it. So if you believe in evolution, then that's not God doing it. So therefore you have to throw all the creation accounts out of the Bible. Well, look at Genesis 1.27. If uh, evolution is true, then we are not in the image of God. In other words, we're not in the image of God. What are we in the image of? We're in the image of of random mutations in accordance with survival of the fittest with the pressures from our environment over time. We're victims of our gravity. We're victims of, uh, of competition. Any way you want to do it, but we are what we are by mutation of the genes, the base groups, and the genes on the DNA. And... Uh, so then we're not in the image of God because we started out as a one cell living organism without a nuclear membrane and then over a few hundred million years we come uh, cells with a nuclear membrane where our DNA was contained in a package and then some way or another we become into fungi and then the fungi some way or another sort of separated out into plants and animals and over in the animal part with all these different uh, uh, these species, subspecies, and all, we finally arrive up to man. After we go through kingdom, phylum, order, you know, all that, we finally wind up with Homo sapiens, which is genus species, which we're supposed to are, and we've evolved to this point, see? And so, then, uh, we're not in the image of a God, because if we're in the image of God, then God must have been non-existent, because we were non-existent at one time. God must have been a one cell without a nuclear membrane and a one cell with a nuclear membrane. I don't know. This is crazy to even talk that way. But if, if you're not in the image of God, then what are we? We're just victims of our evolution. So then we go to Genesis 1.27, and it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And you notice that Adam and Eve's both included here. It's not just Adam. Male, male and female. He made them living. They came from the non-living to the living. Eve came from the living. God took some living flesh from Adam, and he made Eve out of living flesh from Adam. The living from the living. He modified her DNA in that he changed some way or another Rather than have the male have an XY chromosome, Eve had XX chromosome. I don't know if he added to the Y what he did, but he just, the way he created, he just created. And so we're in the image of God. Now we talked about what it was like to be in the image of God. The first thing is, to be in the image of God, is that we are eternal. We will never cease to exist. Nobody in this room is going to cease to exist. Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, you are not going to cease to exist. No annihilation, no nether nether land, no limbo, no soul sleep, none of this stuff. We are eternal as we sit in this room. And when our spirit comes out of our body, when it says, hey body, you're not inhabitable anymore, I'm leaving you. Like when we get involved in an automobile accident and maybe we hit a 18-wheeler head on at 100 miles an hour and our spirit says, you know, I'll see you later, body, because you're just not in too good a shape for me to stick around in. So the spirit departs the body instantly, right then. That's the moment of death. And there's no such thing as being brain dead. There's no such thing as being any kind of dead. You're either alive with your spirit in your body, or you have a dead body left behind and your eternal spirit is gone. And the eternal spirit doesn't come back and get back in the body. No doctor brings you back to the living. 
Now they use these terms all the time. I died on the surgery table twice and they brought me back alive. Well that makes your doctor God. Because God's the one that puts the spirit in the body and he's the one that removes it. James 2.26 says, The body without the spirit is dead. Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed unto man wants to die and after that the judgment. Now they can do many things. Heart can be stopped, brain waves be flat. You know, you can have all kinds of core temperature dropping, have dropped very low. Clinically, we feel you are deceased. But if you revive, that doesn't mean that your spirit came back and jumped in your body by any doctor doing anything. Only God does this. And God demonstrates that he doesn't do it very often. Very few people were brought back to life in the Old Testament and very few in the New Testament, and only to demonstrate very important lessons. One of them, Jesus did it because it was necessary for him to do that to prove he was the Messiah. He had to cause the blind to see, the lame to walk, cure leprosy, and bring the dead back alive. And uh, when John the Baptist's disciples went and says, Are you indeed the Messiah? John wasn't questioning where Jesus was the Messiah or not. John was trying to get his disciples to realize who Jesus was. And so then when Jesus says, you just simply go back and tell John what you have seen, you know, the blind to see, the lame to walk, the blind to see, you know, and uh, all that, and the, and the dead have been raised to life. So then, right then and there, they knew this was the Messiah. And John was wanting them to transfer because he knew he was going to be martyred. And so he wanted them to follow Jesus and not set up some kind of uh, religious system worshiping John the Baptist. That's the reason why God had uh, Michael the archangel to hide Moses' body and took it away from uh, Satan. Satan tried to get a hold of Moses' body when Moses died on Mount Nebo. And uh, so uh, uh, the archangel had to call on God to make Satan go away because Satan was probably more powerful than that other angel because remember Satan was the highest of all angels and I don't see anywhere where God stripped Satan of his power. Now God controls Satan. But I don't see anywhere where he stripped him of his power. He's a very powerful angel. He's a fallen angel. Just like we're fallen men, there are fallen angels. We have redemption possible. Theirs is permanent. There's no redemption possible for them. But um, anyway, uh, Moses' spirit had left the body. It says his vision was not dim. He wasn't any weaker or anything else. It was just time for God to take his spirit out of his body. So his body was dead. The angel hid the body. Why? So the people wouldn't find it and do what? Put a, build a big tabernacle there and stop right there and not go on to the promised land and start a religion of the worship of Moses. And uh, because man has a tendency to do those kind of things, to set up some kind of earthly system of religion. Hey, that's what the Tower of Babel was about, if you recall. Well, the image of God... We're eternal, never cease to exist. God had no starting. God has no ending. We have a starting point. We have no ending. We're able to procreate like God can create. God can create something from nothing. We cannot create something from nothing. But we can create something brand new from something. And that's called our children. When we bring, when a husband and wife brings into this, this world a child, you have just created a new human being that never existed before. See, that totally destroys any kind of reincarnation. Totally destroys any kind of reincarnation. Totally destroys annihilation, totally destroys reincarnation. These destroy, these little simple things right here destroy world religions that are based upon these false theologies, uh, based upon false gods and things like that. But what happens is, you know, that we, we have no annihilationism. And we create a new life in our children that never existed before. And that new life is what? Eternal. Your children are eternal. They're eternal beings. They will never cease to exist. Our grandchildren are eternal. They will never cease to exist. We're all eternal, see. Well, if evolution is true, then man is just another animal. And if evolution is true, the earth began in chaos. Genesis 1, 31. And God doesn't say that. So 
God lied. See, if you believe, if you believe in evolution, if evolution is true, then God lied. And boy, that's quite a challenge there. Genesis 1.31 says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Not chaos, not killing, not survival of the fittest, not mutations. It was very good. And he just got through saying he made man, male and female, they didn't have to evolve. And he made man straight, he made animals straight, he made plants straight, he made the fish in the waters straight, he made the fowl of the air straight. None of them evolved from the others. So God is a liar. If evolution is true, then God is a liar. You see, if you believe in evolution, you don't really sometimes think through what you're believing in. And not only that, there's no special day. Days are just the time it takes the earth to turn around on its axis and face the sun at the same time each day. You call that one day, a day-night cycle. There's no special day. They're just continuing until our sun burns out and we all turn to a great big ice ball. But whereas in the creation account, we have a special day. God set aside one day in seven. And he said, hey, this day is for worship. That's what the original Sabbath day was for, the seventh day. God demonstrated he didn't have to rest. He wasn't tired. He doesn't get tired. But he demonstrated to man, man didn't get tired then. Man was in perfect shape. He hadn't fallen yet. He didn't get tired. He had no work to do. Everything was perfect and beautiful. All he had to do was worship God, enjoy the earth he'd given him, enjoy his mate, and to uh, enjoy everything and enjoy actually walking with God in this special place the garden God had provided. Now, if evolution is true, none of that story is true. The Bible is false, fake mythology. You cannot believe it. You cannot trust it. I had a vice president of one of our denominational colleges tell me one time, I got in a little discussion with him, and he says, oh yeah, I believe the Bible. Yes, sir, I believe the Bible, everything it says, starting with chapter 12 of Genesis. In other words, he was telling me he did not believe the first 11 chapters of Genesis. The creation account of God, the making of uh, man in the image of God, the establishment of uh, man perfect and then man fail into sin, the fall of man is there. Uh, the institution of murder is there, institution of polygamy is there. Uh, you know, all, he's telling me then that he does not believe all these things after you get beyond the first 11 chapters. The first 11, he doesn't believe there was only one language at one time and God confused the languages. He does not believe there was a worldwide flood. He doesn't believe in any such person as Noah. And that was a vice president of one of our denominational colleges where we send our children to get a Christian education. And um, you might want to check the science department out and the psychology department, the sociology department before you send your children off to any school. Because that's the areas where they will grab their minds, those three departments. Well, there's no special day. Every day is just continuing day. God said there is a special day. There's no absolute moral code. You know, God, here in 2.16, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may eat, and then he restricted the tree. In other words, God established a moral code. You may eat of all this, but you can't eat of that. Well, this moral code is updated every time that we go through a, uh, an episode where a man is rebelled and God redeems. This moral code gets upgraded all the way up to Mount Sinai where it goes into the Mosaic Covenant and where they have the Ten Commandments and a lot of other things. These are moral codes. They're absolutes. They're absolutes. Today, I am amazed at how many Christians today believe it is okay to lie if it serves a good purpose. I just, that just blows my mind. Situational ethics. It's okay to lie if it serves a good purpose. Our, our brothers in Russia really, uh, I've run into this quite a bit over there because they, they had to be very manipulative because of the communist system and the persecution on the church and I guess they had probably told lies before to serve good purpose to save the lives of their fellow Christians. And so they used the story of Rahab lying 
to the king's men and they use a story of the um, Egyptian midwives lying to Pharaoh about the birth of the Hebrew children to justify that. But see, when we do that, what you're saying is God is not powerful enough. I need to lie to help God. And see, that just violates everything that we're taught about a moral code. We do not have to lie to help God. We just don't have to do that. God does not need our help in lying. So we find situational ethics are involved. So today, there's no absolute moral code. Then the codes we have, our law we have, is strictly determined by man for man, and it's man at the time he's living in according with the circumstance he's living under. So therefore, we need to get rid of these children that are unplanned for, you know, and uh, we need to have abortion so that we can keep our standard of living up and children are expensive and they get in your way. So therefore we develop a code that accepts uh, abortion. Homosexuality? Well, they're born that way. No, God didn't make us male and female. And God really didn't mean it when he said a, uh, a man will have a wife, his, his own li a wife, and a man and a woman constitutes a marriage. No, 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 no. That's uh, based in these first 11 chapters of Genesis that are mythology. And uh, there's no absolutes there. I mean, after all, if they're born that way, then shouldn't we support them and give them insurance and uh, give them uh, all kinds of the same benefits as a male-female marriage? See, when you start tearing down the creation account in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, you have destroyed the entire foundation for the entire Bible. You have no Bible. If you have no creation and you have no first 11 chapters of Genesis, you have no Bible. It would take us months, but I could go through here and show you that if you throw out the first 11 chapters, you might as well throw out 95% of the rest of the Bible. You have to throw out many, many things that Jesus Christ said. When we get started in the New Testament this fall, we'll bring those to our attention of where Christ refers back to the flood or the creation or marriage and different things that were established in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And so you can see then that we have no absolute moral codes and there's others. We could spend days and days of going through this. Woman did not come from man. There's no such thing as sin. There's no devil. Well, Genesis 3.1, the devil came to Adam and Eve in the garden. But remember, that's in Genesis 3. That's, uh, that's mythology, right? Over in Job 1.6 and Job 2.1, Satan appeared before God in heaven twice. And so then also no personal God. If you have uh, evolution, you have no personal God that's involved with you. Genesis 3.8, and where this God walked with him, he came to him, he appeared to him. And you get the flood account in Genesis 7 through 9. And there was no worldwide flood, even though I have referred to. And we have referred to in many Psalms. Never just one language, yet in Genesis 11, 1, it says, the earth was of one language. Israel did not cross the Red Sea, as it says in Exodus 14, 21, 22. No miracles. If you believe in evolution, there are no miracles. Therefore, they did not cross it. The Red Sea. So therefore you have to write the Exodus story. You have to go to Psalms 136 and throw it out. And if one verse in Psalms 136 is untrue, then does that mean that the entire psalm is not reliable? And uh, so we, we could go on and on one more very quickly. And uh, no commandments, no absolutes. This is just a religious code. And Romans 1, keep coming back to this, God uses these invisible things to show us, you know, about himself. And but man did not glorify God. And what he did, he uh, become wise in his own way, which really he become a fool. And he turned to man-made things. You really need to look at Romans chapter 1 very closely. You can go to 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5. And uh, this is not a physical warfare that we're involved in, creationism and evolutionism. Uh, you know, and you, it's a spiritual warfare and you cannot fight it with carnal weapons. And what we have to do is take captive every thought process. And remember, that is the very thing that we've been talking about and we've been ending this up with 
And we've been saying, you know, like the evolutionists I read to you out of a science book, said if you think about something long enough, it's just bound to have occurred. Well, Psalms 119.11, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. So you have to hide Genesis 1 and 11 in your heart so that you will not sin against God. You can't go around throwing it out. So we'll start from there next week. Is any one of